I vividly remember five years ago, I was hit by a sad and troubling news item showing a devastated dairy farmer in Ethiopia. I recall his name was Dewit, a rugged, outdoorsy man. And Dewit had lost all his livestock because of water shortages in his region. There was just not enough water for his animals to stay alive. And the dreaded dry season had not even started yet. The image of that suffering grabbed me because that farmer could have been my uncle, would my uncle, who is also a dairy farmer, had been born on a different continent. A researcher by background, I had to dive deeper and grapple the cause of the weed's affliction. And to my great surprise, I discovered that it was I myself that was impacting this Ethiopian pharmacist's livelihood because of what I do and because of how I live. I was shocked to discover that my water use or my water footprint had spread out like a virus all across the world, much farther than I could ever imagine. And not only that, I was humbled and dismayed that my water footprint was so large, too large. May I ask you, do you have any idea how much water you use on an average day? Do you know how large your water footprint is? I am from the Netherlands, as you probably could have guessed from my shirt. Um, <laughs> And we got plenty of water, right? Water scarcity and drought seem distant predicaments, not in the least affecting me. So why bother about my water use? But after studying the topic for many years since, I stand here fully convinced that it is absolutely vital for every one of us to give some deep thought to our water footprint and to become aware of the impact that it has. Let's start with some common assumptions we have about our water use. We generally think we use it in and around the house, right? For washing, for cooking, for cleaning, for flushing the toilet. And we think we're doing really well if we install a water-saving shower head. Or if we turn off the tap when we are brushing our teeth. And we think we're doing really great if we buy a water-efficient washing machine, right? Make sense? I mean, that's what I used to think. <laughs> And a friend from Britain once told me that they think we stingy Dutch even wash our cars when it rains just to save on water. <laughs> but boy, was I wrong. I was dumbstruck when I found that the activities that I thought used water, the washing, the cooking, the cleaning, that those activities together made up less than 1% of my total water footprint. Less than 1%. You see, I had only listed the direct part of my footprint, the part that is used in and around the house. But my total water footprint is the sum of the water that is used for all the activities or products that we consume. So I missed the indirect part of my footprint. You may say the hidden water. The water that is tucked away in often remote supply chains where it is used to produce the products that we buy, the clothes that we wear, and the food that we eat. That is where the remaining 99% is. It is in our lifestyle choices. Now through trade in products from one country to the other, we virtually trade water too, and thereby cause our lifestyles to have an impact on water resources far away, far beyond our tap at home. And the numbers don't lie. Shall I share our actual water footprint? We use, on average, 4,000 liters per day to support our modern consumer lifestyles. 4,000 liters! What a staggering number, right? I mean, that's what? Equivalent to taking 20 baths every single day? <laughs> that's crazy, 4,000 liters. But what does that imply? What are the ramifications of these large footprints? Do you think our planet can handle that, sustain that? I'm sorry to initiate you into some discomforting truths about the impact that this water footprint has. 
And I'll do that by sharing three short stories in which I'll show how our water footprint is too large or unsustainable. It is unfair and it is horribly inefficient. For the coffee lovers among you, let's first dive into the realm of coffee production. And let me introduce you to Abebe, a Kenya, an Ethiopian coffee farmer, an amiable Ben, with a big smile from ear to ear. And he works from dusk till dawn to make sure that you and I can enjoy a delicious cup of coffee for breakfast tomorrow. He mainly relies on rainwater for his crops to grow, but he also has an irrigation system set up to lead water from the nearby river onto his fields. Unfortunately, the river is being overexploited because many more farmers and companies and communities all draw from the same limited supply. <laughs> There's just not enough water to support river ecosystems, so fish die. There's not enough water, especially in dry years, for a baby to irrigate his fields, so his crops die. And there is not enough water to support the demand of his downstream neighbor, our friend the wheat, the livestock farmer, and we saw eventually his animals died. You see, the beans for my cup of coffee, for me to stay awake, eh, for just one cup, needed 140 liters on a baby's farm to grow. Water that was partially taken from the river and that was therefore no longer available for his downstream neighbor, for the wheat. And this story illustrates how too many competing demands for water eventually cause everyone to lose, fish, farmers, and families alike. Is it sustainable to just keep and keep on drawing until there's nothing left? And please don't think that this story is exceptional. All around the world, we see rivers run dry we see groundwater tables drop. And to say with Thomas Fuller, only then, when the wells run dry, will we know the true value of water. The typical narrative, then, is that local farmers cannot make ends meet, so decide to migrate to the big city, hoping for better luck. But there, overcrowding and incongruous viewpoints lead to quarrels and conflicts, sometimes even violent conflicts, and potentially water wars. Yes, there are conflicts over water in the Middle East, in the Nile Basin, elsewhere. And the ordeal will only worsen with growing populations, increased wealth and climate change. <laughs> Whereas with floods and earthquakes, we immediately see its devastating fallout. What a scarcity, you could say, is misery in slow motion. Misery in slow motion. And our unsustainable footprint is only adding to that misery. The second story will be about meat. If you are a conventional carnivore, then the water footprint of your meat-based diet is 4,300 liters per day. Whereas if you're a vegetarian, the water footprint of your diet is only 2,700 liters per day or 40% smaller. And the reason is that the animals that we eat are fed enormous quantities of soy and maize, which require a ton of water to grow. If we struggle to feed growing populations in an ever scarcer world, is it then fair to use 2,000 liters for one steak to feed certain people, notably the rich? especially knowing that the price of water and the cost of its negative impacts, as we just saw, are not being discounted into the price that you and I pay for that stake. The last story will be about cotton. If I look around, I see a lot of people wearing cotton, of course. But where did it come from? What were the origins? Where was it grown? That's a tricky question. It turns out it's very hard to determine the origin of the cotton, even though it matters a lot. Because in some places, cotton requires 5,000 liters to grow <laughs> to produce the equivalent of one t-shirt. 5,000 liters for one shirt, for us to stay warm. But in other places, that same cotton shirt requires only 2,000 liters for the cotton to grow. And the research behind these numbers show that the explaining factor is farm management. 
In other words, if a farmer really needs 5,000 liters to produce only one shirt, we know 3,000 liters at least are being wasted needlessly. So is that an efficient way of dealing with our resources? <laughs> and I thought I was doing so well with my water-efficient washing machine. But now I know my footprint is large, too large, way too large, causing scarcity and misery in countless places. So the question that remains is this. Can we all stay awake, well-fed, and warm while using our water resources everywhere sustainably, efficiently, and fairly? I am convinced that we can, if we all take on this shared responsibility, where businesses can do their share, as can governments, but also you and I, the modern consumers of today's globalized world, can take action. Remember, we determine what our footprint will be through our lifestyle choices. So find out how water-intensive your lifestyle is. Although, since virtually no brand in the world properly labels or reports their water use and its impacts, I guess you're up for a hard time. So what can we do to start making informed decisions? We have to ask them to start labeling the water use and the impact of their products. As a matter of fact, why don't we do it right now as I'm done talking? Think of one or two water-intensive products and bombard the social media platforms of the producers with requests. Okay? What else can we do? We can reduce our food waste, reduce our clothing waste, lower our meat consumption. Why don't we introduce a meatless Monday? I promise, guys, you will survive. And for the greater good, the juice is absolutely worth the squeeze. If we take on this shared responsibility, if we become good water stewards, if we start making water-sustainable lifestyle choices, we can avert dry rivers, dead fish, and deprived communities, and go from scarcity to abundance. <laughs>